Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And, of course, I want to just state again that we do consultations available at Nutramedical. They're $150 for those who are not customers. But if you're a customer, you get a consultation if you've purchased products free. And that means not only an email consultation, which we provide for everybody, a very short one. It's a quick answer. Uh, and uh, a, v- a verbal consultation. And we have also the, Q, uh, the quantum resonance magnetic analyzer testing. Those consultations are available as well. We charge for those. But if you purchase a machine, they'll be available. And I'll be posting them up after the show today. You can call our order line and pre-order because they're going to disappear very quickly. We already have a number of people who have called us and I want one, I want one. And, of course, when they get a machine, they can email the report. Now we have our, our nutraceuticals are far superior to Longevity out there, uh, life extension, Amazon vitamins. I mean, we'll go down to the long list of all the different vitamins. And you want to have tracks chelated minerals that are going to be protein amino acid chelates. You want to have all the phytonutrients. But you can't just take something like noni berry, which is not nearly as powerful as astaxanthin or anhydrous catechins. We can do head to head studies and prove that to you. If you don't believe it, we can measure DNA markers, 8-hydroxy-2 prime deoxyguanosine, which we measure in nuclear isotopes. If we have a person, say, working around a nuclear plant, we measure T-bars, 8-hydroxy-2 prime deoxyguanosine, which is a DNA addict of guanosine. Um, so these things are measurable. Now, I wanna, we're going to have a full special hour this hour, and I'm going to let Chris answer and talk a lot here. But we want to introduce some of the really serious stories because this hour is going to be on Fukushima. I'm also going to be in the second hour as a guest tonight on rents, and I'll talk about this and other issues about the approaching H7 and 9 super plague. And we have our contact contacting me this morning, uh, Paul Martin. I don't know. We might have our board. I'll try to recontact Paul if he's available. He has contacts inside the government that have now scientists that are completely freaked out by H7 and 9 that they've decided to weaponize. This virus replicates 80,000 times faster. Now, if you see the combination, immune systems are failing because of increased levels of toxins, electropollution, Fukushima Daiichi radiotoxins, GMO food, mineral depletion of the soil from farming practices. And so the population herd immunity is dropping. At the same time, we're eating radioactive fish, for example, from the sea, and people aren't being told by the government, by the way, the bluefin tuna is hot today, not because it's on sale, but because it is hot, it's radioactive. So that's one of the FDA scientists. Don't worry about radioactive fish. And this is published on a few days ago. This scientist, by the way, needs to be a new type of law called criminal law dealing with, with the scientific fraud. Because this, whether he's a government department official or a private person sitting on his academic laurels making a public statement that puts people in danger, he needs to be in danger of his seizing his assets and putting his his uh, personage into a steel cell called jail. So, uh, Chris, tell us about the latest. What's going on there? Because some of the crazy things that are going on is worse than the Keystone cops at Fukushima. And these other countries now are starting to raise to the level where they're now considering in South Korea, this is an international crime, what's going on in Japan. Not only the Fukushima in action, but burning 100 million tons plus of trash uh, that's mobilizing this into the atmosphere. So what's happening? Okay, Dr. Bill, again, I just want to thank you for letting me uh, discuss, uh, I guess, the subject uh, on your program. And um, I'd like to just start off, you talked about criminal aspects of um, uh, lack of preparedness. And, uh, well, there are there are some motions now to, uh, and, and uh, in uh, the con and Naoto from the, uh, he was the head of, uh, of TEPCO at one point. And uh, there are some folks trying to indict him on, but the courts are saying, you know, it really wasn't his fault, it's an act of God. What I'm just going to tell you right now is that there were some other, uh, there were some other surrounding villages. We call them unsophisticated fishing towns, right? They don't really, really know very much. They're not very sophisticated. <clears throat> How could they know anything? Except they knew enough to build the seawall much greater than anticipated, and their their fishing villages were saved. Ironically, you know, you have all of the uh, collective wit of um, of a major corporation, and they couldn't see foresee this coming. Well, so, they had the sharp engineering pencil, as they call it in engineering, which means the accountants or bean counters decided that seawall X feet high is fine. This event only happens every thousand years, so no problem. Yeah, well... Okay. All it takes is one time, and now you can see what, what happens when you're not 
prepared. And, and uh, so this was a this was a disaster. It was the one-two punch. And I'm going to just go direct our attention to uh, a Reuters article that came out on the 13th, and it, the headline is "After Disaster: The Deadliest Part of Japan's New." nuclear cleanup is to have well the cleanup of course has to be afterwards because it's really not over yet so i just want to go ahead and clarify a few points right. in this article but it is a very good article and reuters put it out so that's a that's actually very interesting that some of the mainstream are now repeating a lot of the i'm going to call them facts that we had introduced i think they're uh, plagiarizing and we talked about this like the korean times talking about being in a violation of international law you can see that's good. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I think it's good that the mainstream, or we call it usually the lame brain media, is finally catching up. But it's a little late because now they have a danger of subsidence, and this is the real big thing. They decided to put a seawall up, and instead of turning, you know, putting boronated material and turning the entire site into a crystalline mass, and then walling it off so it can, doesn't have access to seawater that can get in there with sea channels, so that they can dry it out. And turn into a giant crystal and create a sarcophagus for us. For it, what we have is 800, not 300 tons, but more like 800 tons of radioactive water that's getting in the Pacific Ocean or venting off through steam channels all the way to the tube trains in North to- Tokyo, and uh, venting off miles away into just the general landscape because there's cro- cracks in the rock. What's happening now is this final subsidence phase, where literally the, the soil can become thixotropic or liquefy could cause these uh, cooling pools that are sitting on the top, which is crazy engineering design, to fall, and all this corium is going to mix, and we have three things going on. The vent fuel rod assemblies are now cannot be extracted by a crane because they're bent. Number two, they don't know where the corium is that's already gone below what we call ground zero, uh, and now we have these other fuel rod assembly bundles and these other cooling pools and everything going to fall to the ground, and that mixture is going to start causing three things. It's going to cause, cause tritium to increase slow neutrons to increase and critical reactions which means you're going to have nuclear explosions and there's a direct link between the fault line running from Fukushima Daiichi and Mount Fuji which is now according to their uh, volcanic assessment is now starting to fill the magma chamber which does every 150 years roughly and which means Mount Fuji is rumbling and the Japanese course history is don't bother the dragon at Fuji because when it blows the devastation from the blowing off of that particular type of volcano usually kills everything within 150 miles of it, but this could be much worse. We could have a hydrovolcanic explosion and a nuclear explosion at the site that will be greater than all the nuclear weapons detonated in history. And that could create literally a subsidence of a good chunk of northern Japan under the waves and a tsunami that could be a half a mile high when it hits California. So we don't know. These are a lot of questions we're asking because we know the amount of nuclear material and the criticality could be a stuttering nuclear explosion or one big one. It could be a hydro, basically a hydrogen explosion that triggers off a critical reaction. What's going on now is they're not stabilizing the situation at all. And now it's so radioactive that no living person, even if they knew what the site was originally looked like, could even go on site. And they don't have radiation-proof robots. They're, they're basically pumping water in just to make sure it doesn't blow up. But it's only a matter of time before a really major explosion happens at the site, either a hydrogen explosion or a true nuclear explosion, which we are pretty certain happened in Cooling Pool 3, where there literally was a nuclear explosion that shot a lot of the fuel rod assemblies as far away as 60 miles. So uh, this is going to get crazy. And uh, and it's one, it's the nuclear disaster is very unique that the disaster actually gets worse as time goes on rather than better. It's not like, you know... You know, an area burns down because of a forest fire, and then eventually you stop the fire and burn, turn out the roots and everything. This, no, this disaster is just getting ahead of steam on, and it's going to get a lot worse. We come back. We'll hear more from. Yeah, we're going to hear a lot more from Chris when we come back because we've got a full hour program. If you have questions on specifically on Fukushima, we're going to touch on the H7 and 9 and the SARS-2 virus because they're tied to this. And if you have a question regarding Fukushima Daiichi, um, whether you're here or Japan, the number to call 800-259-5791. 
And again, Chris, this is your radio name. You're one of the nuclear expert consultants. You were actually recently in Korea for KEPCO, which is a Korean company that deals with their nuclear reactors. And there was some buzz in the media that maybe the xenon was coming from North Korea, but in actual fact, we knew it was coming from the fresh uh, criticality occurring at Fukushima Daiichi. <clears throat> you have lots of points to mention today, so let's let's roll on. We talk about the fuel rod assembly bundles, talk about subsidence and the literally the toppling of these towers that can occur. And um, where's all this going? They need to consider two real major weapons. We need to stop slow neutrons and we need to stop hydrogen generation. The goal is to dry it out and turn it into a giant super crystalline structure on site, form a sarcophagus around it, keep it dry, and enclose it in a stable tomb forever. That's what we should plan. Well, let me let me just uh, go back to the Reuters article and say it's containing radiation equivalent to 14,000 times the amount released in the atomic bomb attack on Fukushima 68 years ago. More than 1,300 used fuel rod assemblies at time together need to be removed from a building that is vulnerable to collapse. Should another earthquake hit the area? Now, I just I read that, but I'm going to I like to read some of the things. And then I'm going to tell you what it doesn't say because I really like to analyze what they're not telling you also. So, yes, I, I do agree that uh, from Unit 4 and, and from all the other units, there are a significant amount of uh, fuel assemblies. But let me go tell you what, the, what they comprise. Now, some of the assemblies, that Unit 4 was the one that, that, that was shored up and was uh, actually, people have actually gone in to uh, bolster up the structure because it was... Boeing and and leaning. That's number number one. Number two, that's the one that I wrote about with the only thing holding the water in the spent fuel pool, and I still stand by this, is the refueling cavity seal, which is the most, that's the, that's the Achilles heel, that's the most uh, likely to drain the spent fuel pool of its water. Then ain't because the gates still leak and the refueling cavity is full. Now, a long time ago, I know I sent you, we did an in-depth uh, discussion of that. Any kind of a toppling over, any kind of, it, it, the building wouldn't have to topple over. All it would have to do is get some misalignment on that and tear the seal, which right. even though it's made of, uh, even though it's made of, um, uh, I believe this one's an aluminum one. I don't know. Right, but the other thing is stainless. Right. What happens is a thing called neutron annealing, which makes the metal stru- crystal structure break down over time, and also what's called the doped rubber around the fuel assemblies, which is actually a boronated rubber. That rubber, when it hits enough neutron density, it eventually starts to break down and flake into a little flaky pie, pie crust. So the problem is the fuel oil assemblies, even if there's no earthquake, <clears throat> are going to eventually break down, which means criticality is going to increase. And... Uh, uh, you know, what they need to do is consider that if they don't entomb this very quickly, they're going to have a big problem. Now, I know they're worried about earthquakes, but an interesting fact in earthquakes is that if you have one building that falls from an earthquake, let's say along the San Andreas fault line zone, and you actually check the frequencies, the frequencies that are in the earthquake itself have to be harmonic with frequencies in the building to destroy the building. So, in other words, the reason why the other building didn't fall is because there's not harmonic frequencies that are similar to the building. Uh, and people need to know that when you have a tectonic harmonic effect, it has to have frequencies that were within the structure of the building to cause destruction. So you could use, no- like, if you want to call it noise canceling technology, like we use for our headphones, you could use that along a fault line to cancel the harmonic frequencies that release the uh, tectonic energy in a big jump to cause a big earthquake because it's better to have 10,000 little tiny quakes that you hardly feel than to have one big one that can cause building destruction and throw roadways and overpasses all into disarray. The same thing can be done anywhere else. So what they need to do is, number one, have piezoelectric threshold sensors along the fault line because your piezoelectric currents change before quake is going to happen. You also have a change in the plasma above the earthquake in the upper troposphere, which you can see with magnetosphere analyzers like the Japanese ones are up there in our space-based classified satellites that look at torsion field imaging. And if you had ground-based, and they're doing this here in California, uh, what's called telluric current sensors along the fault lines, the same thing could be used in Japan. I think that the best move is to have our goal to make a sarcophagus, stabilize so that there are no earthquakes, will cause mini quakes either every day, tiny quakes that won't cause destruction, 
make sure you dry it out so the seawater can't get to it, and then control neutron flux and hydrogen generation. So if you're listening out there, if you don't do these things, you'll never control this thing, and you can't move it off-site because you can't get any either electronic equipment or cranes or people now because we've made the site so radioactive, and the U.S. government are resistant to using deep space radiation-proof robots. They're resistant to gamma rays, cosmic background radiation, and zeta particles that will destroy the integrated circus with things like the triple prom atmel chip because it's a weapon of warfare for a potential third world war because it's completely resistant to electromagnetic pulse and to cosmic and x-rays. And that's why they won't pull out these weapons because they don't want to tell people, yeah, look at the big bad stuff we have. And of course, you know, industrial espionage, etc. If the Japanese or anybody else get a hold of it, it changes the equation dramatically in terms of a third world war because it won't be what you can throw at the other people, but it's what they can disable that counts. And, um, you know, America is literally centuries ahead of anybody else. And anybody stupid enough to attack America will become a, a, a destroyed cinder, the same way as Israel. Israel is right at the cutting edge of these advanced technology. And anybody who thinks that they're going to attack Israel, including whether it's Egypt, these other countries will be given burnt to a cinder. They have no idea what they're facing. And, and it's interesting that you said that because we know the seismic response of all the buildings because uh, uh, it's been analyzed, so it's, it wouldn't be difficult to change them. But I guess it'd be sort of like a marching unit breaking stride. Yeah, what you, what you do, what you do is so that they don't. It, yeah, and as you see an earthquake start to march in across the uh, the Pacific Ocean, that's in the fault yeah. upthrust zone, like the one off of uh, 75 miles off Fukushima Daiichi. You simply sense or hear that P wave and the other frequencies and you have a harmonic subsonic frequency generator that cancels that frequency out. So you have what we call microquakes rather than a big megaquake. Mm-hmm. That's how it works. It's real simple. And yeah. that could be yeah. used here in California and elsewhere. If anybody's out there and they're an earthquake technologist, I'll explain in equations that it's the piezoelectric slip, slip threshold and the, the, the line, fault lines are naturally releasing thousands of quakes a day here in California. Uh, and we can simply use that technology, noise cancelling technology, to stop superquakes from happening. There's no need for it. So the tectonic plates are going to keep moving, but it's better to move them, you know, a hundredth of a millimeter per day than have them move six inches in one hour or ten minutes or ten seconds. We can uh, let's go back to uh, actual work being performed at uh, Fukushima Unit Four. Anyway, the plans are in November to start pulling or removing the fuel. The question is always, you know, are you going, what's going to keep the fuel subcritical as you're withdrawing it from the pool? And that, that hasn't been answered to my satisfaction yet because, and here's, here's the big reason, yeah, although, there are, although there are a lot of spent fuel assemblies in there which could, could achieve criticality, there are also 200 new fuel assemblies which have equivalent to it's like full tank of gas, let's call it that. Yeah. Those are the ones most likely to go critical first. Yeah. And come back wow. and, and once they go, everything that. goes. When we come back, we have a caller, our contact with inside the government. Paul Martin is on the line. We'll have him back in a second. We'll give a quick update and then continue with our special report on Fukushima Daiichi. You can irradiate the host. Welcome back, and we have a quick report from Paul Martin, and we're going to mention is the name of the doctor, the bioscientist, is Dr. Bob B. We're not going to give his full last name, but he is a uh, infectious disease expert inside a major government uh, department that has given you a report. What has he said, Paul? Uh, he was simply telling me, in his in his opinion and his fears, is that this H7N9 plus is... You talked about off air. We've got the H5N1 now in Cambodia uh, and uh, Vietnam. We've got the H3N2B as well as the H1N1 in the Indiana area. And his concern is these things meeting up. His opinion is that this will be the most devastating virus the planet has ever seen. One of the By meeting up, you mean a mixing vessel, meaning the two holes. It could be a pig, it could be a bird, it can be a ferret. They mix, and so the viruses grow inside the same host, and then they swap genes, called a, a recombination, which is recombinomics.com, Dr. Henry L. Nyman. What this basically means is it's only a matter of time. My guess is the first wave could be as early as this October with the Hajj with SARS-2, but the age 7 and 9 could happen any day. It could be next week. It could also come in multiple waves over as long as a decade. So you might have your first wave this fall, which is not easily transmissible, but... 
if Dr. Bob B has analyzed it, what he's going to look at as a scientist it will be number one, um, how fast does the virus replicate, which is reports that I've heard is 80,000 times faster than any other flu virus in history. Number two, yep. how many genes does it have in its receptor binding domain that are common with the human genome, so therefore it can transfer to humans quickly? And number three, where is the repository of the virus growing? Is it like in SARS-2 in camels? Is it like H5N1, which is now in all wild bird populations on every continent? Is it an H1N1, which is in pigs and humans now, because we have H1N1 floating around? Even mild flu, H3N2, uh, which has a full receptor binding domain, but the lethal genes in the H7N9, you get them growing in the same individual, and you get a real big problem. You have what we call an Armageddon virus. And I can't yeah, I know when it'll ha- happen, but the government, remember, the government wants a uh, plausibility deniability. And I mentioned this on Tuesday with uh, Brent Sr. from Doomsday Castle. And he's an aerospace engineer. Uh, wouldn't give his last name. He lives up the mountains in North Carolina, has 10 kids. Uh, cute family trying to see if they can survive. Interesting series. The problem is he thinks that the government, quote, are preparing and that you know, uh, it's unperiodic to think that the government are not going to protect us. Well, no, the government wants to create a disaster, and this is what people have to grasp, so they maintain control before the natural disasters happen that they can't control, like a coronal mass ejection, uh, a meteor storm, uh, you know, a supernova, or God knows what it is. Anything that happens that can be a natural disaster or an airborne plague that they don't have control of, or just a UV surge from the sun. And right now the sun is converting it from the North Pole to South and every 11 years, and we're in the middle of cycle 24, it's already flipped, the North Pole has flipped, and then the next month so it'll flip the South Pole of the sun. And we have at least one sun grazer comet, now two since a few weeks ago, the Ison comet, which is an elliptical comet from deep space because something's pushing it in. That something is the red dwarf star I talked about before. It's coming in from deep space, which is 0.73 light years out. That's a long way out, 0.73 light years. And uh, those comets have been coming in for a long time. So this object pushed them in who knows how long ago, decades or even centuries ago. But they are coming in, and the Ison comet will be a sun grazer this fall, and it's going to make a superstorm on the sun. If it happens to be aimed at us, people like, like uh, Doomsday Preppers, uh, like Brent Sr., better be prepared. But what I see is the government wants to create a sufficient amount of what they call control disasters, like a control burn in a fire with firefighters, so that they can get control so we don't interfere with their survival because their plan, and I saw this in the FEMA manual, is not to interfere with the public for six months but to mop up after six months after a major catastrophe. So there's no intention by the government to do anything other than hunker down and protect themselves in continuity of government It'll be completely controlled by ex-military, civilian militia, and sheriffs, and maybe even some gangs that join the public because they don't want to be on the other side because there may be gang groups that are actually trying to control territories. The, the military aren't even in the equation except to become part of the, quote, civilian expanded militia. And they may be officers or people that are veterans that have already had multiple terms or they're trainers that have had experience as veterans uh, or sheriffs or people that are, you know, gun training experts. The fact is that uh, the government won't be in control of this at all. It'll be civilian militia, it'll be on the local level. And what people need to realize is that martial law and the things like these giant databases, like the one with the seven, the five uh, zettabytes of data up in Utah and 147 others, we'll get into this later. This is for cybernetic control, it's for hyperspace control, it's for lots of stuff that's really weird. It's almost like wizardry, if you want to call it. But it's not to stop terrorism. Terrorism is just an epiphenomenon. If they wanted to stop it, I could tell them exactly how to do it. But they don't. They're not doing it. They're not separating lines at airports. They're not screening all traffic and containers coming in for nuclear isotopes. They're not making sure the people that have Islamic uh, mosques in America do not preach a Sharia law. They're not closing uh, 147 civil detention training military camps inside the continental lower 48 states that are training with live weapons and armaments by Muslims right now. And the fact is the government's fully aware they have the GPS coordinates of these and they're doing nothing because they want disaster just like they want the marathon bombing up in Boston. And I, and I had to impress on this to, to, to Brent Sr. because he's an ex-military trainer. They have to understand the government are not your friend. The government are in there to 
literally make sure they control the dialectic of chaos so that they, when they get enough control, they can prevent the public from interfering with their and their government and their elite survival and the resurrection of a new civilization after this one crashes. That's what they're up to. Well, one of the Does that things that Dr. B, one of the things that Dr. B is uh, looking at, I'll get off the air, is that uh, his, he's skewing, looking for the first 100 to 150 cases in any metropolitan area in this country, and then he will be, uh, he and his wife will be bugging out to their uh, bug out spot to get completely right. away. And by the way, we t- when we talk to our other viral experts and doctors, like we talked to Dr. Gary Reidenauer, who's going to practice up in, in uh, Reno, Nevada. He's an internist and infectious disease expert, and wrote uh, *Pandemic*. Uh, most of the health professionals are either know they're going to be they're going to become history. They're going to hunker down in their homes. They're leaving. They're not going to be at the emergency department waiting for you to come in with the, with the Armageddon plague. And once enough people, health professionals start dying because they don't have proper protection in the emergency departments, hospitals, and clinics. You're going to see whoever's left and hasn't gotten sick. They're going to disappear. So if you don't have the skill sets to protect yourself, if you don't have nutraceuticals like Nutridyne, uh, first line defense kits, uh, Silver 100, so Power C Plus to stop cytokine storms, Allergon, if you don't have these things to protect yourself, you're in serious trouble. And there's no conventional treatment. Don't expect a vaccine. Don't expect that the government's going to be arrived there and get, have enough ECMO machines to put you in heart-lung bypass. Because even if you do get that sick, your chances of survival from these very deadly bugs is between 10 and 20%. And you'll never be the same if you do survive. Absolutely. Well, I think it's, uh, as as uh, he's already stated, is uh, on the question of a virus. He said it's impossible to make a virus for this. Well, no. Well, first off, there's a theoretical way to make a vaccine if you know what the genetics will be at the time it strikes its peak. But remember, it's going to keep on recombining and forming new versions. So the version that say arrives November seventh of 2013 might not be the version of May 14th, 2014, or October 12th, 2015. And this can continue like the Asian flu that went over 11 years with new recombinant uh, minor modifications to the receptor binding domain and the genetic structure so the immune system wasn't fully tuned up to deal with it. So even if you had a natural exposure to a previous virus like H1N1, you don't have full coverage and protection. And... uh, some of these viruses are able to evade the normal immune system response, so they replicate and create a massive viral load. And when the body catches on to this giant viral load, they go into what's called cytokine storm, which is why young people died in 1918, not because the virus overwhelmed them, but because their immune system overwhelmed their ability to tolerate free radicals. And that's where Power C Plus comes in, Gamma E, uh, uh, e Plus, Allergon to stop cytokine storms, but the Power C is the most important. So, yeah, and as the immune systems of our population drops because of Fukushima Daiichi, smart meters, cell phone towers, genetically modified food, toxic vaccines, and the aging of the population, and just stress, the stress of the economy, paycheck to paycheck, the chances of a major airborne plague causing a major catastrophe is getting very imminent. You better prepare. To uh, Chris Harris, Chris, I want I tie this together because I want people to realize it's a two-headed monster. Uh, I call it the Fukushima Zilla monster. Remember, well, Fukushima Zilla doesn't just spew radiation; it spews airborne viruses. And uh, you know, Japan now is also suffering from abenomics, where they're literally have literally their. Uh, <laughs> this is hard to believe, but they actually have spent 250 percent their GDP this last year, and they're primarily doing things like building more military hardware to sell to other countries as their way of getting out of abenomics, lowering the corporate tax rate and raising the the, uh, citizen tax rate to the ceiling. This is all crazy, and uh, on on top of the fact they're not spending money along with internationally, it should be everybody's responsibility, not just Japan, General Electric, America, NATO, everybody's being cooked by radio accumulation of these isotopes. And as the population's immune system fails, and remember, it's poisoning the phytoplankton and the zooplankton and the oceans. It's in, in one of the articles, I'm yeah, sorry, in one of the articles I sent you, there, there was, a, uh, and I was wondering if you can comment on this, an outbreak of foot, mouth, and hand disease in Japan right now, and it's the worst outbreak um, that they've seen in, except for two years ago, which is right, well, when 
Moved Easy to way to tell. It, it, you do a test called a natural killer cell activity test, and it can be done in 24 hours at places like Immunosciences in Beverly Hills with Dr. Aristo Vujidani. Uh, and that test, an NK killer cell test, which shows immune system suppression of the Japanese. You can see photos of young women with their teeth falling out. They're bleeding from yeah. their orifices. Uh, they're bleeding from their nose. People that visited there are having all kinds of problems like bloody diarrhea, coughing up blood. Uh, this is not a joke, people. What's going on is an environmental catastrophe of biblical proportions. This is like one of the end time plagues, and I'm trying to tell people they need to take this seriously. God armed me with the technical and, and scientific knowledge as well as the spiritual to warn them this is a warning sign that the time of trouble is coming. And their answer is actually not to solve the problems. And, and I had to disagree very strongly with Mr. Brent Sr. from Doomsday Castle, who is a former military person and an aircraft engineer, is the fact is the government doesn't care for you. The government's not doing anything, and you have to determine, you know, by people's actions. If the government was doing something, they'd harden the grid, they'd start deactivating all old-style nuclear reactors, they'd move the radioactive isotopes off-site, or like in Japan, where it's a waste site, they'd literally harden a sarcophagus around it to prevent it from further causing criticality or explosions, or protect it so if there is an earthquake, they're not going to have a major release of radiation. But none of these things are happening. So you don't believe what people say, you have to believe what people do, or governments. And when you ask tough questions like I do, I can't get an answer or response back from Daryl Ice, my local co uh, congressman who literally probably lives within blocks of my house here in Vista, California. I can't get answers from Lisa Mercado, from, from um, sorry, uh, Senator Feinstein, our so-called nuclear expert, who when I asked tough questions, he would have got a big fat zero if I was the guy reviewing his PhD candidate paper. He would not get a pass. And then we have Senator Wyden up in Oregon, and none of these people responded when I recommended last year, it's over a year now, the idea of doing plume detectors by putting simple, cheap radiation detectors with a Wi-Fi network to send to ground. When you know the flight path of a commercial airline jet, you can actually create a plume uh, map to tell where a large radiation plume is going to come over and rain down a particular area. People need to be prepared for, quote, hazmat activation. So if you're in, let's say, Indiana, and all of a sudden it's going to rain, and you know a giant plume is hitting your way, you should be prepared to say, I'm going to have my raincoat outside, and my boots, and I'm going to have my NIOSH mask on. My EPA folders turned on, and my windows are closed tight, and they're actually sealed so that I'm not pulling in nanoparticles of radiation, and I've taken my radiation protection pills. And we need to start treating it like that. We need to stop pretending because we can't see it or smell it or taste it. And part of the reason why the bees are dying is not just due to neonicotinoid pesticides, smart meters and Wi-Fi networks that screw up their torsion field navigation systems. And it's not just due to, it's due to radioisotopes, it's due to the taco chip from Halifax, from the plasmids of Bacillus thuringiensis toxin gets in their gut bacteria and then literally fries their little, little bee brains. We are not long after the bees. Einstein is attributed to saying this, that four years after the bees go, we go. And I'm trying to tell everybody, and they want to see, the people are still resistant. They want to attack the messenger because, well, that Diggle, he just talks too fast, he interrupts his guests, and he thinks he knows everything. I don't know everything, but the things that I have concentrated on, I've gone out after like a wild man to know everything I can about it and synthesize it together in a concrete matrix of at least questions. Even if I don't have all the answers, to say, if we don't approach this problem in this particular way, we're going to, we're done. Human race is done. Our civilization is done. We're not just talking about a bad day. We're not just talking about a disaster where northern Japan will go into the ocean. We're talking about where much of humanity or most of it will either be dead or mutant. You know, it'll be like the, the, the day after tomorrow, only a nuclear day after tomorrow. It'll be like the children of men where the youngest person in civilization died. So, Chris, I'm waiting to follow that up with where is this going with Fukushima Daiichi? Where is it going uh, in terms of people's personal protection? Because I really think if they take our nutraceuticals like our Nutritrala, Nutridefense, Nutriodine, if they use NIOSH masks, if they start having radiation detectors and UV detectors, if they start forming a network and posting it up so people will know when a radiation plume is coming, people will know, hey, it's going to rain, which is really bad. And that rain, well, you, is, know, you know, it can happen when it's not raining. You can take hazmat active uh, steps, which are real simple real simple for your civil defense because you're going to get blasted with radiation and we have detectors last week in the what's called the beta detectors over uh, Denver, Colorado shot up to over 500 uh, counts per minute 
and people need to know that these surges are, are happening in waves. I'm watching our radiation detector here, and it can come up and for an hour or so. It's up to 80 or 90 counts per minute, and then it's back down to 50. Uh, these detectors are really sensitive. And you know where it is? It's sitting in my kitchen. It's not outside on a bench. It's sitting in my kitchen. Okay, and I have a HEPA filter in my house, a real high-quality one, and most of the time the windows are closed, sometimes they're open, but that HEPA filter, and we have sunny days here. We haven't had rain here for a couple of weeks, and we don't have a little sprinkling. But where it's bad is where it rains. So if you're in Indiana or in your, in Belarus, Russia, or if you're in London or in the east coast of, of North America, Canada, or New York State, and it's raining like crazy, and there's a large radiation plume at 30,000 feet, and all of a sudden this clouds form, you're going to get all these nice isotopes down in your plants, your food, your water, and your air, and it's going to vaporize. And you're sucking it up, and you're bioaccumulating it. And don't think the government doesn't know. They're not going to tell you about the fish. The FDA are going to tell you the fish is fine. Stop complaining. Stop asking questions. Don't ask questions. I mean, one of the articles I sent you was from you know, from an Alaskan newspaper <clears> saying <throat> that we're we're not testing fish because. Tell us what, what it said. What did it say, Chris? Because when I read that, oh, you no, sent it to me. I go. I did. What? I'm good thing I was sitting down because it would have fallen down. I was like, I'm holding my head and I'm not going to say any obscenities today. You know, I got a little bit mad the other day, but I can tell you, <laughs> inside there's a dozen obscenities going on in my head as to oh my. OMG, oh my G. I'm, I'm, I can't believe that these guys have the, the, the cojones to actually yeah. say things like that, like, don't worry about the fish. Hey, don't rock the boat. You know that. Don't rock the boat and don't, don't upset the industry. Yeah. And believe in my PhD. If you don't want to know the answer, don't ask the question. I mean, that's right. Really, don't really don't tell me how many million say. units of, of radiation, of radioactive iodine 131 are present. Don't tell me about plutonium or cesium 134. That bioaccumulates right. and can cause cardiac arrhythmias, endotheliitis, and cardiac arrest. Don't tell me that by cesium 134 will concentrate in the breasts of women and cause a massive surge of breast cancer. Don't tell me about that. Don't tell me about strontium 90, which we tested back in the 50s after above ground testing to see if it was in the tooth of babies, because it's not just in the, in the triangular area around the testing zones, it was worldwide. They were testing teeth, baby Let's teeth from little babies in Canada. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. that's, that's, that's what it, and you know what we've always we've been talking about. You know, this is an aqueous release, an ocean release. Right. But I tell you what, now the spent fuel uh, operation that they plan on doing, well, that's a potential for an airborne release. So by all means, keep the batteries fresh in your uh, in your rad monitor because you're going to need to know exactly what's going on when they when they drop some fuel. And uh, by the way, they do have some experience in moving fuel for some purpose in the past because they're going to use their uh, common spent fuel pool and we, we probably have a conjecture as to why they have that but it's not fuel that's been fresh out of the out of the reactor two years or two and a half years usually a 10 year takes takes 10 years to cool it off enough to really move it so now they're going to try to use the same equipment that they move uh their we, older fuel with well, we, well, you, it, it, you know before the yeah. Hey, Chris, you know before the talkies when they had the uh, Keystone Cops, which are really funny shows if you ever watched them in black and white? Yeah. Uh, this is the TEPCO Keystone Cops, only it's not funny. This is that as is scary funny. as that was funny, or maybe a thousand times. And some pictures that, that were recently really shows that oh, a lot of fuel is damaged. So when they go ahead and, yeah. and so, put the grapple on it, and they pull it up, it's going to fall apart. And as you said before, the Boraflex has been eaten away. In the, it doesn't take salt water very good. And, exactly. And uh, the protection against criticalities, well, there you go. We're going to potentially see an air Amazing update. Awesome. I'll be on Hour 2 as a guest in Rents. I'll be updating the Super Plagues and Fukushima and much, much more of the quantum universe. Again, consoles are available now, triple...